Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Washington Humanitarian Forum. My name is Mvemba Pezo Dizolele. I'm the Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Program here at the Center. We are excited to be able to share with you in this discussion on redefining trust in aid in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The DRC has been at the front pages, on the front pages and the front lines, and at the intersection of conflict, peacekeeping, humanitarian aid, and development. Recently, with the resurgence of the M23 rebel movement in North Kivu, we've seen that these issues that uh, are relevant to the space have come back to the fore. The United Nations have a large, if not the largest peacekeeping mission in the DRC. That mission has run into trouble over and over again, particularly because the civilian populations in the region feel that they have been underperforming. And this is a problem because it raises a number of questions. Is the mission adequate? Is the paradigm the right paradigm that we need for these kind of situations? Recently, um, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, speaking to a French TV station, had considered that the M23 was better equipped than the UN peacekeeping forces in the DRC. That raises a number of questions. How can a rebel movement be better equipped than the force that represents the entire world? Who's arming them? Rwanda said they're not arming them. Uganda said no. UN experts, the group of UN experts report said Rwanda is arming them. If Rwanda is arming them, then there's a problem because Rwanda is a troop, troop contributing country and is very proud of its record in contributing troops. Be that as it may, uh, it raises another question. Where is the Congolese army? Uh, why is it that a country as rich as the DRC has been unable to protect its own civilians? As far as the civilians are concerned, it doesn't make any difference. If you are not being protected, you're not being protected. If you are being protected, it doesn't matter who's protecting you. Anybody who protects you is your friend. But as we know, the DRC now has close to 6 million internally displaced people. It's about 10% of the world, the population of internally displaced people in the world. That is unacceptable. That intersection there has created a big gap, a trust deficit, I'll call it, between the UN. We've seen civilian population protests and riots. We saw this up north when they protested and burned down the Ebola treatment center. We saw it recently again when they literally came head to head with UN peacekeepers and this ladder actually opened fire on the civilian population. Where does this leave us? If you are working in the development space, if you're working in humanitarian space and you're dealing with a population that doesn't trust you, how do you cope with that situation? So these are some of the questions that we'll be answering today. We will be joined by uh, a great panel. I'm going to introduce them. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Joseph Sani, who is the Vice President of the Africa Center at the United States Institute of Peace. Dr. Sani has over 20 years of experience working at the forefront of peace, peace building with civil, civil society, government, businesses, and international organizations as well as moderating high-level, multi-stakeholder multi policy uh, and um, collaborative action at the national level across the continent. The second speaker is um, Abraham Leno, who is the executive director of the Eastern Congo Initiative. As a humanitarian leader, Abraham has led humanitarian efforts in Liberia, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Balochistan in Pakistan, and now the Democratic Republic of Congo. We also join online by um, Ani Modi, who is the executive director of Afia Mama. It's an organization that deals with women's health. Um, 
she's committed, the, the organization is committed to the reproductive health and access to justice for women as well as leadership development and economic empowerment, legal assistance and social development of young women in DRC. And finally, Vianney Bissimois. Vianney is also joining us online, is the regional director of CIVIC, uh, Sahel program. Prior, prior to joining CIVIC, he served as country director in Mali and head of Goma and Kinshasa offices in the Democratic Republic of Congo with search for common ground. You have their bios on your online and also on the document that you received. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our panels, our panel, excuse me, starting with Dr. Sani, then we go to you, Mr. Leno, and then Modi, Ani Modi, Ani Modi and then um, Vianney, please. All right, well, I can, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, and thank you, Vimba, for uh, uh, inviting us here, and we thank you for your time, uh, as well as an audience, and around the world. Um, I think Vemba has laid a foundation for what a complex issue we, we're trying to address here, trust. I mean, we all, uh, it's something that we work in our own relationships, in our own families, and now you tie Congo to it, and you tie humanitarian aid and all the um, uh, conflict uh, issues that are associated with uh, assessing this. So I will start with a disclaimer. <laughs> uh, five minutes of a conversation is never going to be enough, nor even an hour and a half to be able to delve into the complexity of what the Congo conflict, what the humanitarian situation, nor uh, the issues of how we should build trust around MONUSCO. But probably with uh, these few minutes that we have together, we can instigate a conversation that will try to address some of the issues. Uh, and I will be speaking from an angle of a person that has lived in Congo for over 10 years in Eastern Congo in Goma. I actually went to Congo. So I will start by a story. I went to Congo uh, uh, the day M23, which is a rebel movement now that is also terrorizing Congo, was living for the first time. <laughs> uh, that was 10 years ago. They were living in Goma. And I went into Congo. So uh, what I wanted to do was uh, build a social enterprise. And so I wanted to work in healthcare and wanted to accelerate how fast we can deploy healthcare facilities. So I went in with the notion of, okay, I want to build uh, healthcare facilities. And in order to cut cost and time, I decided to bring in prefabricated models of uh, clinics that were developed outside of Congo and tried to import them. So long story short, we brought, I brought in the first one uh, with my team and deployed it in a place around Bukavu. The community, as welcoming as we all know the Congolese community, came in celebrating and dances and, you know, everyone was singing. But there was also a very huge concern in their face. And I saw a very concerning environment. So the elders of the community came to me and said, we want to talk to you, Abraham. I said, okay, what's going on? And they said, when are you taking the container away? Huh. Yes, I was, I was as shocked as you are. <laughs> and like, in the middle of a lunch, in the middle of a dance, why are you asking me when I'm taking the container away? So they said, well, we have seen these containers come and they go. So for them, they have seen these prefabricated models of containers that the UN peacekeeping missions deploy. But then, as often as they come in, they also move them, and sometimes un unknown to the communities, the containers disappear, and everybody, so their hopes are dashed. This was the concern that they had, that they were bringing to me and saying, when are you taking the containers away? So, what did that teach me at that time? That building trust was going to require an active listening, an active adaptation of whatever I had planned, or I, whatever I had thought, not an assumption or check in a box. So as a humanitarian, my context is, a, is in humanitarian development. I was a refugee for 11 years and lived in refugee camps. So that's the story that brings me to Congo as well. I want to look at how the common person, the everyday person, views Congo in contrast to how they view a traditional humanitarian organization. 
So allow me, and please, the analysis here are not a critic. They are just to give us a snapshot or a context to how, and my conversations with the, with, with the actual folks, right? So they get the credit and I get the blame if there's any blame to take. <laughs> All right. In Congo, the NGO to a, non, to, to a community person is a known actor. It's a known actor. And by known actor, I mean uh, the humanitarian space goes in with an assessment. You approach the community. You talk to them. You set objectives and plans what you want to achieve. There is a dialogue. There is a conversation. There is, you, you start to build an ownership. The MONUSCO is an unknown actor. Okay, they see um, either the UN trucks or uh, crossing the border and they choose a location where the camp is going to be stationed and path, there is a camp, a UN camp. And then you see people with guns going around and you have no idea what they are doing. So that's one area, non-actor versus, you know, an actor that we don't know who these people are. And the second aspect of uh, the analysis is the tangibles. There is an impact that is visible, that is practical, that comes in with a humanitarian actor in place. If you come in to provide water, you know, if you have assessed that there are water needs, there is a healthcare need, you provide those services and you work along with communities. And on the other hand, it's really a very big question. If you talk to the mama, if you talk to a young person, who looks at Monosco and sees only the fence and the guys coming in with the white vehicles and a gun, and you ask them, what does the Monosco do? They will ask you, what are they doing here? Especially that in the space where that communication has not been very plain, very upfront, and very transparent, the community sets the expectation that these guys with the gun will protect me. And when they don't see that, when they don't get that physical protection, there is a mismatch in or uh, misalignment in the expectations that are set. Um, both UN and the, and the humanitarian actors, the UN peacekeeping mission and the humanitarian actors, are view, they are viewed as disruptors. Okay? That is the truth. Uh, we are disruptors. We disrupt local businesses. There, there's disruption in how the lifestyle. But there is a lot more on the humanitarian side, which is why you find today that the, the attacks are more on the UN side and really not on the humanitarians because that disruption comes with some information and level of, of empathy, uh, 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 compromise because of the con consistent communication and conversation that the NGOs or the humanitarian actors have. The, N the, the UNs don't have that. They are all seen as, uh, you know, economic they have, they have brought in economic incentives, so they provide employment. UN Peacekeeping Mission is one of the biggest employers, similar to NGOs. But here is what happens. Uh, these folks that are employed with uh, the, the humanitarian actors, they have benefits, they have some social services that come with uh, those, and the services that are provided are geared towards a sustainable end, right? So, that job is not just a job today, but it's a job that is probably secured for the next couple of years. The UN guys that employ, they employ a lot of people, but when they leave, that's it. So people are not prepared for when that departure happens, and that disruption causes a lot of questioning. So these are some of the issues that we see today within the community, and uh, a major part that I also see and the conversations with the community is the mandate. The NGO, the humanitarian actors, are able to spread out and share a conversation around their mandate. But the communities don't know what is the mandate of the UN. And so humanitarian actors speak out. When there is a humanitarian action, when people in Beni are hacked to death, you know, many times, many times over the past 10 years that I have been there, you have humanitarian actions that uh, actors that speak up, but most times the UN peacekeeping mission is quiet. So people are asking, whose side are you on? And that's a question, that's a voice that the Congolese people really want to have, 
They just want to talk. They want to know if they are owners in these conversations around their well-being, around their safety and their security, and, uh, or if they are not. So some of the riots that we're seeing is really, I'm not condoning any riot, but uh, there is a question to be answered. And I think we are here to, to in a few us. minutes to try. Right. OK, thank you very much, uh, Abraham. Sani. Yes. <clears throat> thank you, Vimba. Uh, thank you for inviting us here and for having this conversation. This is timely and relevant, given the situation you know, on the ground. I will say, I will just pick up where you left, my friend. I, I think um, I will take one step back to say trust also comes from your performance and your engagement with people. Right? So what you have mentioned, there is a lack of communication uh, and then sometimes lack of performance and sometimes MONUSCO is involved in some type of, some kind of abuses. But there is also a dimension of local ownership, right? So it's not just a local ownership of the solutions that maybe MONUSCO is bringing some solutions that people cannot own or don't know what it is, but there's also the ownership of the problem. And it struck me every time I look at um, or I read about the DRC or listen to, I don't have a sense that there is an ownership of the problem by the leadership of the DRC itself. Let's be frank. Um, when I say leadership, not just the political leadership, but also uh, civil society, even the army as well. As we know, if you don't have that local ownership, it's very difficult to be trusted as well. So the MONUSCO is partnering with the least trusted actors in the country. So therefore, uh, I don't think it builds up the, the trust the citizen will have. So there is a question of who are you working with, not who are you working for. And it seems that the engagement with the leadership of the country also has a problem of trust. Citizens are not trusting their leaders. So that aspect combined to the performance of the MONUSCO continue to increase that gap of trust between citizen and MONUSCO. So you have to deal with the performance, but also deal with the type of leadership and partnership that the MONUSCO is building, particularly with the, uh, the leadership of the country. The, the other aspect we may have, we may want to consider is I was I joined this field of peace building through one of our mentors, Hal Sanders. Some of you in the room may know him. He wrote a book on sustained dialogue. And he used to tell me, Sani, you know, leaders sign peace treaties, but only people make peace. And in the DRC, it seems to me that people, the citizen, have been excluded from the process of making peace. Many peace deals were signed. And as we speak, we have very comprehensive and detail-oriented mechanism for tracking peace. We have the oversight mechanism. We have the peace security cooperation framework for DRC. And we have the 18 benchmarks and the transition plan. Those plans are great on paper, but they don't reflect or do not recognize the importance of citizens in making them the reality. So we may sign, we may sit in Kenya or Nairobi or in Kigali and discuss, and even in New York and shake hands as we have seen. But if people are not involved in making those plans a reality, if they are not involved in defining solutions, implementing solutions, I think we have a problem. It will not happen. And that will not build trust. And we know for a fact that the civil society in DRC, particularly in Eastern Congo, is very vibrant, very engaged. The humanitarian sector is quite engaged. But if we cannot leverage that engagement, leverage the social assets that they can bring to, to work towards resolving this conflict, it will be very difficult. We will be back here 10 years 
from now. But that also makes me wonder, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. So people know that. They know that we have to, people sign peace, leaders sign peace treaties, but people make peace. But why are we not making it? So when you look, the, 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 and that, that brings me to a look at the nature of the conflict in the DRC. And that goes back to your question. Do, are we in the right paradigm? Is MONUSCO the right instrument? Because the MONUSCO is part of the tradition of peacekeeping missions with particular templates, etc. But the conflict in DRC has evolved. The incentive structure has changed. It seems to me that the, the wolf is in the barn. There is more incentive to prolong the conflict than there are to resolve the conflict. That's very grave, but it's a fact. Today, a member of the uh, DRC military force, the, uh, the F uh, DRC, makes more money being in the front line than his annual salary, sometimes 10, ten times. Right. Generals are making millions compared to their normal salary. So, honestly, if I'm making millions of dollars on something, why will I stop it? Why? So we have, there is a perversive incentive structure to prolong the conflict than to resolve it. And the third thing I would like to say, the other thing I would like to add in this conversation, because we can't, uh, for me, I don't think we will find answer, but we have to raise the brutal questions facing us. I, I traveled to DRC, and the conflict, in the, it's like we have multiple Congos. People in Kinshasa can spend their time having the Ndombolo, and they will say in the East, it's them that it's, 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 it's like we are talking, imagine a country where you have 5.3 million IDP. IDP is a fancy word, by the way. It means 5.3 million people have left their homes, abandoned, because they are running away. 5.3 million people who were active, productive citizens now are beggars. 5.3 million people who were bosses, had their farms, are beggars. They don't produce anything anymore. 5.3 million people in a given country, but nobody gives a damn. It's like, it's them that get. They love war. It's the part of their culture. There is no national outrage, no national mobilization to say, this has to stop. Let's find a national conference. Let's do something so that we can contribute to it. So, but it's boils down to the pervasive incentive structure of this war. So, yeah, we may talk trust, we may blame MONUSCO and everybody all day long, but there are real elephants in the room that we have to address if we need to start rebuilding the trust and hopefully resolve this conflict. I will stop that. I, think I raised a couple of controversial points, but I think uh, they are worth discussing, frankly. All right. Thank you, Sonny. That's uh, an understatement. It's also interesting because the DRC being that big, the DRC is the size of Western Europe. So we're talking a big country here. Um, it's the only African country with two time zones. That's how big we're talking. So when we have this protracted conflict in the east of the country with a class of citizens making a lot of money out of it, at one point, it's either people rise up to ask the leaders to deliver, end of story, or at one point, or it becomes a problem for the citizen as well in other part of the country, because for a long time they've been told, we're not building much because the money is being invested for the war effort. So after 20 years, this war effort, if you're sitting in Bandaka, you never see the war end, and you never see development. So at one point, he's asking too much of the citizens to continue thinking of the war because they've been told for 20 years that the reason we're not building here because we're investing 
in the war effort. So I think there's those dynamics that are also important. Not that people don't care in those spaces, but like we're tired of hearing about this war. What have we not done? I mean, if you have no hospital in Basankusu or in Loja, but yet you have a tremendous presence of NGOs in the East, to the point you often meet experts who say, I like the East better. That's another, you know, you, we are familiar with this. Do you want to be in Goma or do you want to be in Bandaka? It's like, no, I want to be in Goma. But then there's M23 in the mountains. It's like, there's all these dichotomies about the situation. We'll turn to our friend uh, Ani Modi. Um, please uh, join us for, with your remarks. Thank you. Welcome. I think you're muted. If you please unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Loud, and Loud. Loud and clear. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm just returning from Goma yesterday. I spent five days in the internally displaced camps around Goma. I will tell you that this conversation is coming right at the, the, the right moment. Um, the question around closing the gap and redefining trust in aid in DRC, I think is a, a, that big elephant. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Abraham. Sorry if I, I missed uh, I miscall your name. Uh, the problem here, I agree with uh, a lack of clear communication around the mission, the objectives that uh, MONISCO uh, is, is set for themselves, and the people who sees MONISCO and uh, uh, the expatriates going up and down. Secondly, there is a question of power relations. There is a very uh, disproportionate power relation between people working in the MONISCO and the community where they are working. Thirdly, there is a um, point on economic imbalance between MONISCO and the community they are working at. And adding to a point that uh, was raised before, there is also a question around the sense of impunity, that the population have impunity on some of uh, the MONISCO staff, or the MONISCO uh, blue and men. That sense of impunity on the issues that uh, they've been doing. As I speak for women, I work with women. We will all remember the scandal with uh, who uh, expert in the north, or the great north, or Beni uh, Butembo and uh, on that side. That sense of impunity slowly broke uh, trust between the population and the peacekeeping mission at the start. To the point that now the population are trying, are starting to trust some politicians that do not probably <laughs> deserve their trust because they're starting to think that this is less, uh, they are less uh, uh, problematic than the UN mission. And uh, to add to this uh, point, communication, uh, power relations, economic. Uh, uh, implications. There is also um, something around not assessing the conflict sensitivity, the impact of uh, this mission on the community itself. It's now like we have uh, three stakeholders, the population on one side, the peacekeeping mission on the other side, and the government on the other side. And also one point that was raised as uh, it's coming from youth and also some uh, population is, we noticed that some anti uh, values, things to do around uh, corruption is coming also from 
some people working in the peacekeeping mission. The question for the population is why the mission is still here and we are not having peace yet. The sense of the population have is that the peacekeeping mission is actually a complex of what is happening to the DRC for the past almost three decades now. Thirdly, as I was discussing with a population from, from Goma and around Goma, the, pe the young people say we were born in this conflict and we have lost our relatives. We need the UN to acknowledge that what is happening in the DRC is a genocide at the same uh, 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 way that they have recognized genocide in the neighboring country. Because if we come to look at it closely, in the term of the number of Congolese who have lost their lives since all this instability started in the region, it's very much higher than the number of the people that we killed in 1994. There is, the population, we have a sense that uh, um, the DRC has been ab abandoned by itself. And now we will not uh, speak of the, the, the redefining trust in aid in the DRC without doing a, compar a comparison with uh, Ukraine situation. When comparing, we clearly uh, have a sense that the DRC conflict is not given enough uh, solidarity from international uh, community than conflicts elsewhere. Even when it comes to uh, how international media present uh, DRC issue and when it's presenting other conflicts elsewhere, uh, uh, issues, the difference is quite clear. So all these uh, um, facts combined has really broke uh, trust between the population and the UN peacekeeping mission. Like uh, I heard before, in May I was in Ruchuru, for instance. I saw women and young people in the coffee farms. They had their kettles, they were doing their business. And the same people, I found some of them in Kanyaruchinia as I was there just uh, until yesterday. All they want is peace. And the, 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 the speech of the United Nations uh, General Secretary came as a fuel that was being put on fire. Tension was already here, and we're trying to uh, give right information on, 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 on one side to the other trying to advocate for the UN uh, part to play their role to communicate more tr transparently and to also work with local uh, organizations and community in accessible. It's taking into account the fact that you have a UN mission uh, uh, in, in Kasindi, for instance. What's the rate of literate uh, uh, people you will find amongst the population? So it's good uh, uh, writing up reports, but is this accessible to the population who are seeing MONISCO go up and down? That's one thing. Secondly, that when it comes to transition plan, yeah, uh, who were consulted amongst the community, amongst the population to give their opinion? If ever there were, the inputs, was it considered? No. And most of the population did not even know there were a transition plan already in, uh, uh, being implemented, especially from uh, 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 the Kivus and Hituris. The pe people who might have heard about the uh, transition plan, it's in the Tanganyika or Kasai because they saw some of the uh, peacekeeping offices closed down. That lack of co uh, communication also benefits our own uh, leaders who put all the blame on the peacekeeping mission because they did not um, fulfill the, the, the mission for the past uh, two decades. But why are they not as governments also uh, playing the role as they have to do? We all noticed 
one thing, it's a pattern now. A year before election, there is always tension that will come up between MONISCO and government. And the government officials will put the blame on MONISCO, who is not doing its job and must leave. But right after election, the relationship between the government authority and the UN peacekeeping mission will, get, will become normal until there is the next election coming up. 2023 is an electoral year, and already this year we saw the speech of some of religious leaders, politicians, starting to put all the blame on uh, the UN uh, a peacekeeping mission. So there is a complexity of effects that goes into uh, uh, the situation that broke down trust right now in the DRC and uh, that is, uh, actually has to be uh, addressed separately but, and, uh, in order to get to um, uh, solutions and in order to rebuild that trust. Okay. One of the points that I will put out there is also uh, it setting up responsibility for each stakeholders. For as long as there is a kind of denial. Hello? We can Hello? hear you. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Because there is no one taking responsibility, whether it's on the UN uh, peacekeeping mission or whether it's on the government side, there is no that ownership, taking ownership of responsibility of each stakeholders. So it's for, for each part is the fault of the other part who's not doing their job the way they should be doing it. But who are paying the heavy price of this? It's population. Women are being raped. Young uh, children are out of schools. Or in just one week or so, we have already 2,100 internal displaced people and more all are still coming uh, out of Ruchur. And we have young women who have been collectively raped and released from the occupied region to come to Goma. So this is a message that is being sent. This is the message that is being sent. But how many women participate in the processes of peace, keep, uh, peace uh, uh, negotiation? We were just today telling the, all the, the, the member of the permanent, uh, the permanent member of the UN Security uh, Council that are here in the DRC that there is no women participating in the uh, uh, peace process, and without women around the table, the, any agreement that comes out of uh, there will not be sustainable. So. Line uh, I think your line dropped. We cannot hear you. So we can pause here if it's okay, Annie. You pick up when we have Q&A in the interest of time. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, so we'll go to Vianney. Vianney, welcome, and uh, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, thank you, Vemba, for the introduction, and thank you for other colleague panelists to, to really, uh, especially Modi, giving also this kind of field perspective. Um, and I think this is a very good uh, moment to discuss, you know, trust within the humanitarian sector. And using the DRC as an example is, is also very interesting because it almost 30 years uh, of uh, uh, humanitarian intervention and almost two decades of uh, one of the biggest UN peacekeeping mission. So there's a lot of in terms of lesson learned that, that we can share. And especially when it comes to trust, there is also a lot uh, that we can discuss. So I would like just to mention one or two uh, 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 lessons learned. 
and as 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 um, as um, a Congolese, but also someone working with uh, an organization which is CIVIC, the Center for Civilian Conflict, focusing on protection of civilians, some of my point also will uh, highlight uh, uh, that kind of work. First of all, I want to agree with people who said about the lack of communication. And I want to be clear here, there is the lack of proactive communication when it comes to the UN mission, MONISCO, but also to other external missions and external forces that are intervening or are planning to intervene in DRC. One very last example is this uh, East Africa uh, force that uh, has started to be deployed in DRC with the arrival of Kenyans. So for now, no one is really very well informed about what is their mission, what is their mandate, what kind of partnership do they have with the DRC government, what kind of so far in CONOPS did they find, how far the protection of civilians has been included in their CONOPS, uh, uh, what are the lessons they have learned from the UN mission and other countries' external action to DRC that they are bringing in, who will be like their kind of in counterpart when it comes to engagement with communities. Those kind of questions that are missing now with this East Africa uh, force are the, same, are the same question that were missing and are still missing when it comes to some of the UN mission or also some specific mandates. One other example is like the transition plan as uh, Annie was saying, like really no one is really informed about what going on. A part of very few elites that can have access to the document, but very few people, including researchers locally, do not have access to the document, do not know what is going on. And there is very few information which are very accurate. For example, they say that the, 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 the MONUSCO will leave DRC in 2024. This is not the total truth. The truth say, the, the, the plan say, the UN will leave, the MONUSCO will leave DRC uh, uh, if all the conditions are really set up and good uh, in 2024. So there is still a possibility for an extension of that mission, but no one is aware. That point is not discussed and society actors are not involved. That is just one point about, you know, like proactive communication. Another one is the feeling citizen in DRC has about violence. People mostly used to say, it's when you become violent that people listen to you. And this is because of those very, very number of years where violence actors, Lord Amor, was being like rewarded. And I've been using the same with MONUSCO. So if we don't become violent, if we don't tire, uh, we, if we don't fire tire in the street or destroy, no one will listen to us. And people was calling very timely, like they want to be aware of this transition plan, including to understand if there was the government, what is really their strategy with the UN. No one responded until people were killed. So this culture of we will respond to your question if you become more violent is going to bring citizens to become uh, more violent against the UN. Another one is there is a lot of hidden agenda when it comes to international intervention in DRC or a perception of hidden agenda. One example is like the, 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 the Ugandan presence, uh, Ugandan force, UPDF presence in DRC. There was highly acclaim and welcome in Benin when they arrived by populations because people understood that they were really coming to help the government to fight ADF anger. But then people found out that, you know, these same guys are perhaps supporting the M23 or perhaps one of the interests also was like to try to align the intervention around oil pipelines. So people will still have the perception that there is still some hidden agenda when it comes to any international, including humanitarian intervention and DRC. And if actors are not really play, playing a kind of integrity uh, game, then uh, uh, they are killing all the humanitarian intervention in country. There is also the, the fact that people are tired of war and they want someone to jump in. And they have been like, you know, like they believe that if we try to, 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 to throw stones to international community via the UN, perhaps someone will hear us. Remember that in 2012, in 2012 
when the M23 was again uh, near Goma and after doing the same occupying Ruchoro, there was like some phone calls from the US president, from the UK government and from many other Western countries that really leads uh, uh, M23 to leave Goma and they were defeated. So this gave the people the idea that if international actors, Western countries intervene, then probably, especially the M23 and other armed groups uh, can, 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 can be defeated. Uh, the last one for me is the kind of blame game that we have seen between the government and the UN mission. You will see people from the highest level of the, the, the country, you're really blaming the UN uh, for their presence but not really acknowledging, as Annie say, uh, the, the, the real uh, responsibility of DRC, and really using political manipulation this school to try to say, you know, we are not responsible, they are, they are bigger than us, this is the international community, and which is like leaving them from, and the UN cannot even come to a, to a situation where they say, you know what, they are responsible for that, because they are also, you know, playing uh, uh, their, their own relationship with, with the government. So this is this is almost the reasons why we see this kind of mistrust relationship. There are way for words that we can discuss about what could be done uh, to rebuild trust. One of them could be, for example, to support the community liaison assistant presence when it comes to the UN, those local actors that are going with troops in villages, and they speak the local language, they understand. They should be more supported. There should be a lot of them accompanying troops. Uh, uh, the UN mission should choose one or two clear mandates, for example, just protecting IDP's camp in Ituri and other places, than having a mandate full of like uh, everything, political, international community, regional intervention. This is too much. And it's going to, to really have them being like lost in this complexity. The other one is what uh, Animoni said about the inclusion of the civil society organization in their diversity. There is a lot in DRC, including informal ones and informal leaders when it comes to understanding uh, big decisions and changes within the UN mission. One example on how you can use a powerful tool as Radio Capi uh, was what the UN was doing in the past, actually. There was every Wednesday a, a public information uh, uh, a program at Radio Capi that the UN spokesperson was you know, giving information about what's going on, was giving briefing to journalists. I don't know what happened to that, but I don't see the UN using radio as it was in the past, which is actually a powerful instrument and tool they can use because radio is still now listened almost in, in all the places in, into DRC. And communication should not be not only proactive, it should be like a kind of culture. There should be moment to discuss with the UN and people should be aware of that. If I have an issue, there will be a moment. It will be that day and this moment and I will raise my issue and I will find an answer. I will end up with one example. You remember that when there was the strike against the UN, the municipal, people were killed, including UN uh, 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 um, peacekeepers and also including civilians. The government of DRC and MONUSCO said, we will come back to you, we will do an investigation, and we will come back to you to let you know what is happening. Since now, nothing is telling people what is going on. Where are they with the investigation? Until the day people will go again on the street to ask for a report on the investigation, and there will be other people killed at that time. So these are kind of examples, I think, the UN, including the DRC government and other international partners, and the East Africa community, as it's deploying its force now to DRC, should really learn about rebuilding trust. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, yep. I have one question for the panelists. I'll beg for you to answer that in 30 seconds each, yeah. and then we'll open the, question, the, uh, the mic for our audience, because they've been waiting impatiently to engage with you. And the question is, it is hard to work anywhere without trust, let alone in conflict zones. What would it take to rebuild civilian population trust in the humanitarian aid system? What would you recommend? Each, Vianney already gave his solutions, so we're not gonna go to Vianney, but we're going to go to Annie, 
we'll come to Abraham, and then we'll go to Sunny, and then we'll open it to our audience. So, Ani, you heard the question? Your recommendation on what should be done to rebuild trust, and you have 30 seconds. Thank you. Are you frozen? Okay, so we'll go to Abraham, <laughs> and then Annie, if you back, we'll go to you. Abraham. All right, I mean, there are various uh, aspects to that uh, question, but for the space of time, I want to say that uh, the Congolese community needs to see that somebody cares. Uh, so I wrote here, silence is deadly. There has been a lot of silence around the issue in, uh, of DRC. It's not spoken of, it's spoken of in the, uh, about in corners, but you don't, you know, uh, when was the last time, I'm not putting anybody to the spot, but when did we have a high uh, level delegation going to the DRC and standing in place, going to Goma and saying, we're here because we want this issue to stop. You know, we've seen how the advocacy for Ukraine, you know, all the power delegations that are going there and standing and saying, this has to stop. Well, this has been going on for over 20 years. Can we have a voice? Silence is deadly. So the Congolese people, that is one way we will need to build the trust in Congo when they know that somebody really cares. Okay. Thank you very much, Abraham. Ani, are you back? What will it take to rebuild trust in the humanitarian aid system in DRC? 30 seconds, please. Yes. Hello? We yeah. can hear okay. you. Okay. To me, the first thing is, yeah, uh, it's to acknowledge that what's happening in the DRC uh, is a, a genocide. That's one thing. And the, the second thing is clear, transparent, and truth uh, communication. And uh, 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 lastly, impunity should stop. Some people have to respond to the, the act, whether they are on the UN side or in our own uh, uh, Congolese uh, part, it's clear that with impunity, there will not be any trust. Clear uh, communication is a uh, key to re re rebuilding trust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ani. Yeah, Sani. so I think a lot has been said. I will just build on that. I think that sense of accountability is important, holding people accountable, starting with the leaders at all levels, and the politi politicians, civil society leaders, um, that would be one. And also really giving some thought on local ownership. I think it's important. And that means capacity, that means commitment, and that means contribution as well. Is, I think, uh, asking ourselves or Congolese, what am I doing to bring peace in my community? I think that sense of local ownership, we cannot, we cannot take, we cannot shut, uh, take, as we say in French, you can, shortcut. No, shortcut. no shortcut. We cannot shortcut our way uh, to, the, uh, to, to, solution. to that solution without local ownership. Okay. Very good. Thank you, uh, panelists. I have a few questions for you. I'm going to direct this question to specific persons so we can manage this traffic. First question is, what is the perception of why the Congolese are not included in the peace process? Why are they excluded? Vianney. That's, that is a good one, actually. I believe Congolese are included in the peace process. But the question is, are all the Congolese included in the process? And are you considering the inclusion of all groups? I mean youth groups, I mean women groups, and I mean other groups. This idea of building peace process only with uh, uh, armed actors uh, is bringing a kind of political power and political capital to armed actors. The moment is now that when we are building peace, we bring together around the table uh, armed actors or belligerent or armed groups leaders uh, 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 together with peace actors, women groups, young youth groups, uh, and everybody, including also politicians or, or decision makers on the table. What we've been seeing now is like the peace process has been something highly political, and it seems like you know, it's really handled at the highest level in the country. 
and people are not finding themselves in that process. So what they try to do is to be violent, is to speak too much, and even to use violence to get hurt when it comes to the peace process. One example is about this idea of not bringing back people who was working into armed groups within the, within the army, as within the past, or reopening, you know, the mapping report. It's about transitional justice and how far we've been uh, addressing it. In spite of people strikes, people demonstration and speaking, we have been seeing that elites mostly, and especially political uh, actors, is keeping that report and many others uh, uh, down down the, the table. So for me, the question, the answer is, we should really make sure that we are involving everybody, and we have many level of the peace process or peace dialogue. We start at the local level, be before we go to the national gathering or conference which has been done for many times and did not really solve the problem. Okay, thank you very much, Yane. I think along with accountability, along with inclusion, one elephant, to use uh, Sunny's terminology, is actually lack of legitimacy. I think we've not discussed that. It's the legitimacy of the various actors. You know, humanitarian is good, but what drives that? What, I think Abraham talked about that trust, why you bring this container here? Can you take your container away? Who gave you, the, have you talked to us about what we need, uh, what we need here as opposed to just showing up with your goodies, so to speak, and assuming that we'll welcome you and we'll love it, and then you don't understand why we don't like it. Uh, the UN is the same. I mean, the UN was deployed within a certain context, the Lusaka Accord and so on. The DRC has moved far away from that, those things, but we're still using the same model almost 20 years later. The leadership in Kinshasa is full of people who don't have legitimacy whatsoever. But yet, these are the ones who sit at the conference in Nairobi and other places. We'll take a question from the audience. JT, that's your name, right? Yeah. Okay, JT. Uh, thank you. My name is JT Stanley, and I just came back this year from working with local Congolese NGO in Goma. Uh, Feel okay to say this is too off topic from aid, but I'm wondering what you guys think is the end game with Rwanda and M23. Will it take Goma? What do you think the probability is of, of that? And will it be different from 2013, where could they hold on to it indefinitely? Okay. So your question is addressed to the HQ of the M23? Is that <laughs> <laughs> to your guys' is speculation. <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> sorry. Did anybody want to answer that question? No, you are com just coming from Google. Uh, oh, I can answer that. You see how you want. what your question is. <laughs> we understand your question. Uh, I, I don't know if any of us here is actually qualified to answer that question, to be, to be fair to people. I think that would be more in the speculation space. Um, but I'm sure M23 is not playing to, re to withdraw if you were to ask me. I think they're gonna be try to push this as far and as long as they can. Yeah. Whether that means taking over Goma or something else, but they're not gonna retract anytime soon. And, and if I will add yeah. to that, uh, without, uh, not as a military strategist, but uh, just to say, when you have fighting uh, opposing parties like this, people are always looking for relevance. Uh, for me, some of the things that I'm seeing, elections are coming and they want to be seen as, you know, we're a force to contend with. Uh, we had the Pope that planned an event. He was supposed to arrive in, in DRC. I was very hopeful. I was really happy. On all the vehicles, you see stickers of the Pope. It was such a joyous moment uh, awaiting the Pope to arrive. And suddenly we have this rising tension and M23 trying to show that they have a muscle. Now, you know, that visit was canceled but it's really trying to show a relevance. I don't know if, you know, I, don't, I don't see M23 going to all the way Kinshasa and taking power. To, I, don't, I don't see that happening in, in any space, uh, short space, but they will try to push an agenda so that they stay uh, recognized uh, within the political space. That's what I would say. I think it's also important to understand that the uh Kenya's entry into that space is frustrating a lot of the dynamics in Kigali and in uh, Kampala. 
Uh, Kenya is a very credible actor. They have economic power. They have diplomatic clout. They're not a marauding country. In other words, they're not in the RC just to extract in the way Uganda and Rwanda is done. So the inf infusion of Rwandan, um, of Kiga Kenya, Kenyan forces into the RC is bound to upset a lot of the dynamics. We're not sure how that is going to pan out. They're just arriving. But if you were to ask me just to read the table, that's one thing I'll say. Uh, one other question. Uh, what strategy should the UN take in response to the anti-MONUSCO sentiment? Uh, Ani, you want to take that 30 seconds? Yeah. Uh, the UN have to uh, upgrade their mandate and uh, really stand on the, the DRC uh, forces to regain uh, uh, some of the, the, the zones that have been occupied or taken by the, the armed groups. This is very important. Secondly, uh, the UN have to communicate clearly, transparently, and work with the local dynamics to make the population really understand their mission and the, uh, the, 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 the level of up, what they have to do and what they are not supposed to do. It is very important. And I'm all adding again, the UN have to show that they have taken responsibility to punish some of the UN uh, peacekeeping mission who have compromised the uh, way of living within the, 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 the uh, area of war. So with these three, I believe that the population can start looking uh, at the UN peacekeeping different. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if that's maybe a bit too late. I mean, it's been 20 years almost. Um, but Sunny, you want to say something? No, about... I said, Vianne said something that I think I would like to come back to. It's also clarifying the mandate or even limiting, like downsizing that mandate. It's just too complex to communicate, to, to, to explain. Or you are doing protection of civilians, don't try to do nation building, stabilization, and it's a Christmas tree, basically. That's one. And secondly, I think it's important to operationalize the, next, the triple nexus they talk about, humanitarian development and security. I think for the moment it's still there, up there, elite, very elite, very, very exclusive. But what does it mean for a UN mission and for protection of civilians, that triple nexus? Do we mean that when, because it means also protection of civilians writ large. It's not just about security, it's also livelihood. I mean, what the heck? If you want to protect me, put me in jail. That's the best way to protect me physically. But you will not feed me, right? So, that if when we mean protection of civilian, it is that triple nexus and operationalizing it at the community level, UN working with humanitarian actors, development actors, that will make a difference, a comprehensive difference, I think. All right, thank you very Can much. Can I add something on that? Yes, remember? please go ahead, Yane. Just a quick one. I think it's time for the UN leadership, the MONUSCO leadership in DRC to really go to the ground and to really start the dialogue with people. And it is very important that they leave back their cars, they try to find ways and opportunities to do it. They can use any opportunity which is not violent or very uh, tense to discuss with people. It can be via a festival. I was telling them you can use the Amani festival, you can use any opportunity, but go discuss with people. Don't keep yourself in your office. Don't go and discuss with the government by hoping that the communication from the government will bring down tensions. And if you believe tension is down, go out, leave your office. There was this UN leader who was using motorbikes, using boats to go and meet people in the villages. It's time that people in their offices in Goma and Kinshasa leave their offices and go to the street to meet with people to meet with people in the village, in the camp, 
if the UN cars are targeted, they should use other cars, use local leaders. They could use any mode if they want to go to the health center to discuss with people. But please leave your office and go to discuss and dialogue with people. They will not probably listen to you the first time, but perhaps when it will be the 12th time, they will perhaps start listening. Okay, thank you very much. We'll take one more question from the audience. But before we do, I have a question for all of you panelists. We've talked a lot about the lack of trust vis-a-vis -vis the UN. What is the status of trust between the NGO community and the humanitarian with the population? Because it sounds like every, the entire trust deficit is with the UN. But I will beg to differ. I suppose there's, you studied Abraham with talking about literally describing why people didn't trust you when you showed up with your container. Yeah. So what is the status of that? From Civic, from Afia Mama, Eastern Congo Initiative, you are a bit up there with US, <laughs> US Institute of Peace. But how does this trust deficit manifest with the NGO and within the humanitarian community? And what can be done to redefine that as well? So Viane, Ani, Abraham, and then Sam. 30 seconds each, think, huh? remember, um, 30 seconds, so we can. Yes. We are publishing, Civic is publishing a report at the end of this week, which is called Prioritizing the POC in this UN transition period, which is also giving some kind of lesson learned. But as far as we are concerned as Civic, we believe that having, so what we are missing, for example, now is a huge number of local researchers, Congolese-based researchers, who are getting information, who are really Congolese understanding the context, and who can really like uh, be the one also uh, bringing solutions. So this is one gap. And perhaps the way people see it, they also see it as you know, some kind of you know, external actors, even if our researchers working with a lot of Congolese doing it. So this is one of the things that can happen with us as Civic, but also with many other actors. If people continue to think NGOs as Westerners that came to save Congo, then there is something we are missing over there. And that is an issue actually. And that is also an issue about trust and about the fact that people, I think Abraham talked about ownership. If there is no ownership, it means that people are still not trusting the process and it is important. And last one is humanitarian intervention should keep in mind that there, they are a transition decision, they are a transition process and they are not going to replace the state, the state anymore. Sometimes uh, 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 we take too much of our work that, that creates a lot of expectation and at the end of the day uh, can create a lot of frustration. Okay. So um, localization, if I hear you, it's very important to have the local color, to have local expertise and not be a savior. Um, uh, and at one point, I think external actors own the problem and the UN owns the problem. Um, our friends are very supportive in humanitarian space, and that's a serious problem. And this is why I think when you were welcome with dancers and mistrust from the first day, who was part of this. Um, then yeah. you, and then Sandy. Sure. Um, for us, we have narrowed this down to uh, a very simple fact. We don't build anything in Congo that we ourselves cannot use. So I'm proud to say anybody who goes to Congo, the clinics, that we have built there, I use them, my kids use them, my staff, and you will use them. You will drink the water that I, we put in place. So, you know, it's, there has it's been so much us versus them in the NGO sector, which actually plagued and also caused the issue of mistrust. So we build because we're going to leave, it, and we, we, we do mediocre stuff, right? Uh, because you know, at the end of the day is serving the donor. I have checked the box and I have built what I want to build for the donor and I write a report and go home. No. So for us is that exceptional quality and it is by stating that I would never build something in Congo that I cannot use myself. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will just add, I think for, for me, I'm reminded of one say, I think in South Africa, where you want to build trust, work with people, you go to the people, start with what they know, build on what they have, and together you make the journey. I think, for me, that will be the paradigm. And if people don't follow that paradigm, that's where you have that situation. So you 
can you make the journey because you build those that clinics and then together you can use the clinic, right? But first, no, no. Start with what they know, build on what they have, and together make that journey. For me, that would be the, the thirty second thing. Okay. So there's a lot of material here, a lot of questions. Can I jump in here? Uh, thirty second. We only have one minute to go. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. I just want to really uh, pull attention on one factor. When it comes to NGO, for instance, there is also this division between the international NGOs that get access to resources from donors, and you have national NGOs that have that knowledge of the context that are uh, with the people who do not get to access uh, resources in order to to have uh, to implement the strategies. So this division also has contributed in uh, the lack of trust. So it's about time, like uh, uh, the, 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 the just said now, it's about time that the international NGOs get to work with local NGOs from the conception to implementation of all programs, not just come in and tell the local uh, organization what to do uh, in order to achieve certain uh, uh, objectives and tick the box. So okay. it's very important to value local expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much. So obviously this trust deficit is multidimensional. And until we start filling the various gaps, there will be a lot of mistrust. We'll see protests, we'll see discontent. On that note, I. We will be around to answer some of your questions. The panelists will stick around for a little bit. I'd like to thank our distinguished guests today for your contribution. Very insightful. I'd also like to thank you, our audience here in the room and in the metaverse, for joining us today. Thank you very much. <laughs>